in listen only mode. Hello and welcome to our Business Associates Basics um, webinar. My name is Carlos Leyva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with Digital Business Law Group. We're going to extensively cover um, business associate related questions. This was what by uh, a request that came out of a prior uh, webinar. So we're going to we're going to look at who qualifies as a business associate, uh, what a business associate has to uh, comply with within the privacy rules, security rule, and breach notification, business associate contracts. And we're going to talk a little bit about why, from a marketing perspective. Uh, business associates ought to be out ahead of the curve and uh, you can actually use this as a marketplace um, differentiator uh, because as we all know covered entities and a lot of business associates have sort of been resistant to um, actually complying for various reasons um, so in any case um, as usual, we're going to take questions as we go, and then we have some time later for formal Q&A. Um, and we're going to be talking about business associates, and it turns out that business associates now statutorily have to comply with the entirety, really, of the privacy rule, the security rule, and breach notification rule introduced by the High Tech Act. And I say with with the entirety, is that often is a um, an issue of contention whether or not or how much a business associate has to comply with these through uh, with these three rules and what I would say is by and large there is no business associate light we can talk about different kinds and we will talk about different kinds of business associates and how they may go about complying uh, but um, there is no light version so that's, that's one thing you need to keep in mind. Um, and Martin, as we go through these early um, stages, you can feel free just to uh, you know, interrupt if we got some early questions, uh, et cetera. Otherwise, I'm just going to cover this background material. Um, these are the sections of the High Tech Act. If you click on them, any one of these URLs, you can go out to the Hip Survival Guide and get the full text of the Act. The reason uh, to briefly cover the High Tech Act now is because it, it's, it was really the game changer with respect to business associates. I mean, the concept of business associates was around in, in the old HIPAA, but dramatically changed under the High Tech Act, the High Tech Act given um, uh, the regulations vis-a-vis -vis business associates a lot more teeth and put business associates on the hook statutorily and really just basically change the game with respect to how business associates have to comply. So even in Section 13401, it talks about the application of the security provisions, the security rule, and penalties to business associates. Notification in the case of breach, we'll talk about the role that, um, that business associates have to play uh, in the case of a breach. 13404, application of the privacy rule provisions. So there you go, right here, between 1301, 1342, 1304, you have the three rules implicated statutorily um, under the High Tech Act, right? So, and so when I say statutorily, it means that business associates are directly on the hook um, under the statute and regulations and and therefore HHS can come after a business associate directly without going through in the past business associates uh, could be held liable if they didn't comply with their business associate contract okay now that's really changed right yes you still have to comply with the contract but you're also on the hook statutorily for civil and criminal penalties and of course any improved enforcement um, mandatory audits, um, state AGs bringing suit, et cetera, et cetera, apply to business associates. And um, 13411, the mandatory audits, when they start back up, are going to apply to business associates. So you can see that a large part of 
the High Tech Act was um, targeted targeted specifically business associates. So a foundational question is who is a business associate and you know over five years after the promulgation of the High Tech Act this is still somewhat of a confusing topic um, for various reasons and, and we usually get a lot of questions around it so under the old rules and under the new rules these are all examples of potential business associates administrative personnel accounting your your CPA actuarial consultants technical consultants data aggregators and under the high tech act certain vendors that you now are that covered entities are now interacting with for uh, meaningful use interacting um, for uh, if they're part of an accountable care organization all these sort of data exchange uh, companies and entities they're all business associate by express their express business associate they were actually named in the high tech act um, council can be a business associate and um, entities that re uh, that provide recycling shredding trans transcription storage there's a wide array of potential uh, entities that can be business associates and it's far larger than you would think normally and it's all going to depend on whether or not that business partner that you're dealing with whether or not that business partner has to have access to PHI to perform the business function that you engaged with that business partner to perform so let's take an example here of software vendors so the mere selling or providing of software to a covered entity that doesn't give rise to business associate okay if the vendor does not have access to the PHI of the covered entity now what happens is that even if you have um, you know even if you have client server software that's running on your network it's not on the cloud you know it's, it's completely contained on your local site the software vendors support team you know they often have to get in remote they're looking at the application for potential problems they're looking at um, databases for potential problem problems you know, all that kind of technical support that makes the software vendor a business associate by definition okay that the guidance around software associates uh, so software vendors and business uh, associate the intersection of those the guidance has long been provided by HHS that any kind of technical support like that even if it's uh, not on a daily basis obviously you know most of the time it's not going to be on a daily basis that qualifies that's enough because as a regular part of what that vendor is doing for you they come in contact with the covered entities PHI even though in this particular case the PHI is completely hosted on uh, the covered entity site okay so now there is an exception there's an exception and you know you got to know the rule so that you can understand the exceptions um, in case of a software vendor when an employee of a contractor uh, like a software information technology vendor has his or her primary duty station on site at the covered entity the covered entity may choose to treat the employee of the vendor as a member of the CEs workforce okay so if an individual independent contractor is always on site and is treated as a member of the workforce the exception applies because the the argument is this is that person is under the supervision of the covered entity like any other member of the workforce now, that means that that individual is sitting on site okay now uh, in the past maybe and for big big uh, hospitals big big covered entities maybe you had a dedicated support team that was on site I, I believe today that that's becoming rarer and, and, and is fading away given the quality of the tools that are out there that that will provide virtual access okay so this there is an exception and this is this exception is not really 
you could generalize, you could extrapolate from it to other independent contractors. If you had uh, direct supervision, then you could make this argument, okay? Um, and we have one question, and or two questions actually uh, so far. Sure. Wal Walgreens is, um, I'm sorry, one moment, second. We send scripts directly to Walgreens, et cetera. Is Walgreens a business associate of ours? No, it turns out that Walgreens is a um, covered entity. So, right, any any uh, exchange of PHI for treatment, payment, or operations um, is, is, with another covered entity is not uh, does not establish a business associate relationship. Okay, so that sending scripts to Walgreens or C or uh, CVS or sending medical records to a specialist. That specialist is another covered entity, and that the reason you, you're sending, you know, the medical health record to uh, the other to the specialist for the is for the pur purpose of treatment of the patient. So, you know, the, um, covered entities are not business associates of each other as long as the exchange is for treatment, payment, or operations. Would a cloud storage service provider be a BA? If the PHI is always encrypted by the CE before being transmitted and stored, yeah, that that encryption question comes up all the time. It doesn't make any it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference that uh, HHS made clear in the omnibus rule. Any third party partner that stores maintains stores or maintains uh, PHI on your behalf that's a business associate. There was no. There was no, but if you encrypted, you know that that none of that applies. You know, if they're storing it on your behalf, whether it's encrypted or not, there's some benefits, uh, right, for 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 storing it encrypted because you can then take advantage of the the breach notification safe harbor, etc. But that doesn't that doesn't make the business rela uh, associate relationship moot. You would still need a business a business associate contract. Um, with that entity, and that entity would still have to statutorily comply with the three rules. Okay, we're good for the moment. All right. So now this this is an exception that, that, that's been around even before the cloud. Any business entity that is classified as a courier um, is not a business associate. So for example, UPS or FedEx or the U.S. Postal Service, certain private couriers and their electronic equivalents that merely act as conduits for PHI. So your your local ISP that's providing you the pipe that you're using to, to transmit PHI to your business partners, that ISP is just a conduit and they're not a business associate. So you don't have to go out and get a business associate relationship with uh, your ISP because uh, because they're just behaving as a conduit. You don't have to have one with um, with these couriers, okay? And HHS, HHS reinforced this conduit exception uh, in the omnibus rule. It's been around for a long time with respect to the Postal Service, FedEx, etc., and it's just been broadened to um, to the Internet. And here you can click on this link, uh, HHS, um, if they're still maintaining it here, maintained um, some marketing collateral, some, I'm not really marketing, but you know, some collateral around how do you figure out who a business associate is. And uh, if they haven't changed the page, that's, that's where you can get some of this guidance that HHS will uh, put forth from time to time. Now, you know, a lot of people, you can get off into the weeds here um, and, and when you start thinking about this. So, uh, you know, there, it's um, a few basic rules, though, can kind of guide you. Because, you know, people say, well, what about, you know, what about housekeeping or what about our landscaping company? And so what HHS has said vis-a-vis uh, -vis those types of entities is that, 
if the service they provide does not involve the user disclosure of PHI to accomplish what they need to get done, then any access to PHI by such persons or entities is incidental to what they do. In other words, a janitorial service doesn't need PHI to do what it needs to do. Now, it may come in contact with PHI because it's in the, for example, in the hospital, it's in the rooms, etc. but that contact is incidental too. Landscaping, landscapers would be incidental too, okay? And so those types of entities are not uh, business associates. And the test is, do they need PHI? It is, it is the provisioning of PHI on the part of the covered entity to this business partner necessary for the business partner to do what they do, okay? And so that's the test. So you don't need to turn, you don't need to have a business associate agreement with your housekeeping staff. You don't need to train your housekeeping staff. They, they, they I mean, you may want to, right? Because there's, there's a whole other uh, potential liability out there, uh, you know, regarding negligence and state law actions. And we're starting to see more state law based lawsuits uh, under un, under a negligence theory, not under a not under HIPAA, because individuals can't bring in a lawsuit under HIPAA. Okay, so there may be other reasons to do it, but you're not required to do it under HIPAA. Um, here's a question along those lines: We contract services for laundry and dietary services, so we would not need a BA agreement with them. No, right? If we just apply the test, does laundry, do the laundry people uh, have to have PHI to perform the business function that they perform on behalf uh, uh, of your organization? Well, no. I mean, right? They can they don't need the PHI. They may incidentally come in contact with it when they're in the room, but they don't need it. Um, you know, the dietary, the, the people that provide the food, even if they're delivering it, they don't need PHI to carry out the business function that you contracted with them uh, to perform, but they incidentally probably come in contact with it if they're delivering meals uh, or when they're delivering meals to the room. So, um, right, they, th those type of organizations would be similar to housekeeping, similar to landscaping, et cetera. Is Skype considered a conduit? No, I'm not, I'm not sure that Skype. Um, I'm not sure that Skype would be considered a conduit if you're, uh, you know, if you're using. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I guess Skype is an application, right, that, that you interact with, and you can certainly use Skype for a million and one things. But uh, yes, you could also use it to. Uh, you know, transmit uh, PHI, right? If you, I mean, you have a Skype session, you share the screen, just like we're, you can share the screen with GoToMeeting, with WebEx, etc. And if you're using that to display PHI to a business partner, then no, I don't, I don't think it's an application like that is going to qualify. I mean, I, don't, I haven't seen a case like that, but I would say no, that that's not a conduit. That that would not be a pipe. Right, because because um, it, it, it would it would seem right. It is a close call, but it would seem that the PHI uh, is potentially more exposed to the vendor. The vendor here would be the vendor here would be um, Microsoft, because Microsoft owns Skype, and Microsoft is you know managing the, the the transmissions and it would be interesting. Uh, I mean, it could turn. It could turn. That the answer to that question could turn on exactly whether uh, or to what degree, if any, Microsoft may be storing. Um, they're certainly transmitting, but they may be storing um, PHI uh, just even on a temporary basis. Um. Would an email be considered a conduit? Yeah, you know, email, email, I mean, email, email, like internet email, right, is, you know, you need an ISP or somebody to facilitate that email transmission, 
right? Google doesn't own its own pipes. Well, Google may be trying to own its own pipes, but, you know, the, it, 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 Microsoft doesn't own its own pipes as being like the backbone of the Internet where they, the, the packets actually get transmitted. Okay, it's the ISP, it's the ISPs, it's AT&T, it's Sprint, it's, it, you know, those big infrastructure players that, that own the pipe, right? So you say sending an email, well, what, 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 the, the pipe that you send it, the, the, the entity that controls the pipe that you send the email over would be a conduit, okay? Now, obviously, the, the, the person on the other end, if, if the person on the other end is not a patient or a covered entity that is being, uh, and you're doing this for treatment, payment, or operations, then if you're, if you're not doing it for that, then you're sending it to a business associate, then that's a separate question, right? If you're asking just about the pipe, that's used to transmit the email, then the, the person, the entity that owns the pipe is not going to be a business associate. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, so under High Tech Act Section 13404, a, a business associate is now required to monitor a covered entity's compliance with the contract. So Think about this. Covered entities have always been responsible for monitoring not the operations of their business associate partners, because that, that, that's an impossibility, but they had to monitor the contract. In other words, covered entities couldn't look the other way if it knew that a business associate was in material breach of the contract. Okay, It had an affirmative duty to act. It had to, it, it had to notify the business associate. It had to try to cure. If it couldn't cure, it had to report to the secretary. And you know, it, it, if it could, it, it, it had to break break the relationship with business associate. And if it was impossible, probably because uh, a business associate was mission critical, then you know, you asked for some kind of relief. But you had an affirmative duty to monitor the contract. Now the business associate also has that same affirmative duty to monitor the contract with the covered entity. And if the business associate realizes that the covered entity is in material breach, the business associate has a analogous affirmative duty to act. Okay? And beyond that, because now we have business associates to business associate contracts, right? So subcontractors of a business associate who the business associate provides PHI to perform a function, a business function on behalf of the BA, Right, that requires that requires a contract between the business associate and let's call it the subcontractor, and that has to be monitored by both parties as well. Right, so you got a lot more cooks in the kitchen monitoring the contract. Now, this NPRM, this is late here, right? This is historical, and I decided to use this particular presentation because. It, this has been around for a long time. The omnibus rule just finalized this, but you know uh, the business associate definition um, has changed in the sense that a, a sub of a business associate is now uh, required. Is, is a sub of a business associate that uses PHI for a business associate's behalf is going to be a subcontractor. And here's the the important part of the test: on behalf of a covered entity, okay, or really you can now say on behalf of a BA a function or activity involving the use or disclosure of PHI. That's kind of the, the test. And then you have all these sort of same examples. These were the examples that were built in, um, you know, way back in 1996 when the privacy rule was promulgated, right? They really haven't changed. The context has changed. The guidance has changed a little bit to adopt uh, to the Internet. But, you know, by and large, it hasn't changed, but for example, the, uh, the health information organization, uh, you know, an e-prescribing gateway, any of those data transmission services, the High Tech Act identified those as business associates per se. Okay, they're not conduits. A health information exchange is not a conduit; it's a business associate. So you absolutely have to have a business associate contract with those types of quote-unquote interoperability uh, entities. Uh, this question of a personal health record has now really become moot 
but you know, back in 2010, you had Google Health, you had Microsoft Health Vault, and the question became, well, what about these players that are storing PHI out there in the cloud? And um, unless they were somehow related or tied to a covered entity's electronic health record, and in the case of Microsoft Health Vault, that actually happened because Health Vault is attached to a lot of EHRs. In that case, then Microsoft is a, is a business associate, okay? But in the case that Google just had a standalone personal health record and Microsoft, uh, if it continues to have its own standalone personal health records, those aren't business associates because that's really the patient interacting with those companies. Okay, I, we, we know now that Google Health went out of business and, and Microsoft Health Vault is still around, but I think the majority of uh, patient records stored in Health Vault are stored in conjunction with uh, the electronic health record of a covered entity. Okay, so it's important to get, if you can get your mind around these basic definitions and then apply them, then you can kind of sort through the majority of the cases to identify who's a, a BA and who's not. Now, a BA does not include a healthcare provider, right? Because we talked about the, the, the payment, treatment, and operations exception, right? If you're sending PHI back, back and forth between doctor's offices or doctor's offices in the labs, you know, et cetera, and you're doing it for, for the purpose of treatment of the individual, then that other party's not going to be a business associate. A plan sponsor is not a business associate. A government agency is not a business associate. And a CE part participating in organized health care arrangement, and you have to go back and um, study exactly what this means, right? But there are certain things that are called the health care arrangement where, you know, the, the entities involved in this thing are not business associates of each other. So what it, what it looks like now is a covered entity can have multiple business associates, right, one through N, and I call these the direct business associates, but each one of these business associates can have other business associates, subcontractor one through N. There are also business associates, right, and the subs could have subs all the way down the line, okay, and that has some implications for who gets to establish uh, the business associate contract and has some implications for notification in the case of breach. So we can just cover right now using this graphic, a covered entity does not have to have a business associate uh, agreement with these subcontractors here of business associate one. It only has to have business associate contracts with its direct business associates. It's the responsibility of business associate one to have business associate agreements with its subs, et cetera. Martin, we, we, we have any questions? Yes, we do. <clears throat> this is interesting. How strict is the, quote, on a routine basis, unquote, interpreted? For instance, if a software company only has access when working on a software issue, and this may only happen once a year with a CE. Is that on a routine basis? Yes. The answer would be yes, because, because in order to do what they have to do, they have to come in contact with, you know, often have come in contact with PHI. That's enough. That's enough. That's part of their job responsibility is that in order to do their thing from a business perspective, they may come in contact and often do come in contact with PHI, that's enough. There's no, like I said, there's no light version. So some of these things are, you can't just say, well, it's just once every, you know, two years. And it's like, no, if that's part of their business function, then you're going to have to have a, a, a business associate contract in place. Okay, we're good for the moment. Now, you know, that same thing is true. If, you, if you've got a small um, ambulatory practice, and you know you got Joe down the street that comes in and does your tech support. Well, you better have a business associate contract with Joe down the street because he's a business associate. You know, if you have your CPA coming on site and looking at your records, and as part of looking at those records, they're 
looking at PHI, they're definitely uh, a, a, a business associate, okay? So even though, even though these business associates aren't storing or maintaining PHI on behalf of the covered entity, they still, as a regular part of what they uh, of the business that they do, or the business function that they perform on behalf of the covered entity, have to interact with PHI, and that makes them a BA. Okay, so we, we, we talked about the fact that there were some implications with respect to notification in the case of breach. Okay, and this also gets has some complexity uh, surrounding it. So, it, first of all, let, let me say that it's always the covered it's always the covered entity that has the responsibility to notify patients. HHS and the media, depending on various things, right? That we we, we kind of go over in our breach notification webinars. But uh, so it's always the CE that has the responsibility. The question is, and it's 60 days between from the time that you knew, no longer than 60 days, a reasonable period, but no longer than 60 days. So the clock starts ticking for the CE. Not necessarily when the breach occurred, but when the CE was notified that the breach occurred. Okay? Except, except, and this is an important exception, except if the business associate is an agent of the covered entity. Now you need, and so, well, let me say this. If, if the business associate is an agent of the covered entity, then the clock starts ticking as soon as the business associate knew or should have known of the breach. Okay. Now, agency has nothing to do with the fact that you put in your business associate contract, "Hey, we're not agents of each other." Okay. That's not that's not controlling. Okay. What's controlling is how much operational control uh, be a little redundant here using the same word how much operational control one party has over another okay um, and there's this list under the federal common law of agency and there's Supreme Court case uh, CCNV versus Reed that that's the leading case that lays out these factors and you go through the courts go through these factors to determine to determine agency, right? And so, and it's not any one factor, but control of the other um, entity uh, is is what is, in legal terms, dispositive, right? So I'll give you an example that might be helpful. Let's say your brother-in-law um, is your CPA. But you have such a big, you have a big enough practice, and he's got his own practice. But it's it's really he just works on your stuff, and not only does he just work on your stuff, but you make him come to your site every day. And so you you basically you're you have full control over that individual's livelihood. Okay, that individual is likely to be held an agent if you're. Telling them what to do, telling them when to do it, what hours to show up, blah, blah, blah. That is not an arm's length relationship. The covered entity is exercising too much control. So that's just a warning that you can't just willy-nilly. You know, this agency thing is not going to crop up a lot. But when it does, it's got a big, it's got huge implications vis-a-vis -vis breach notification. Okay, so just to go over some of the same points, whether the parties consider themselves to be agents or not, it's not relevant. It's the courts, because the courts are going to use the federal law of agency, all right, and the Supreme Court considers a, a, a number of these factors. I'm not going to go through these, and I, I give you the case site below to determine agency. So what the, what the parties say about the relationship themselves doesn't mean anything, okay? Now... We do need to understand, despite the fact that there are no 
there are no um, business associate like um, ways that you can comply there are differences between business associates right so I just want to uh, this is one huge difference those that store and maintain PHI they obviously have clearly a more rigorous set of responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis compliance with the rules right and I, and the fact if you're if, if you're a a covered entity like attorney accountant some consultants that don't store and maintain you still have to comply but the fact that you're not storing or maintaining means that your compliance you know is probably not you don't have to deal with you know a disaster recovery issue for example because or you know or you can just document doesn't apply you know because we don't store or maintain PHI on behalf of the covered entity and but it doesn't it, but it doesn't mean that you can ignore it, right? And so when you think about the security rule, you have required, uh, you have standards, and then underneath the standard you have required implementation specifications that are mandated, and you have addressable implementa implementation specifications where there's a little wiggle room depending on, uh, you know, the type of organization, the type of relationship, et cetera, et cetera. But even when you're documenting your um, compliance with the security rule, you just can't ignore that stuff because you don't store or maintain. You have to go through, each, you still have to have your policies, you still have to have procedures, you, you still have to go through and analyze each one of those implementation specifications. And if there's some that are addressable that you don't implement, you have to document why you didn't implement. So it's not a, it's not a uh, free ride to ignore the security rule, for example, just because you don't store PHI, and obviously, it, it should go without saying that this that this has some, you know, it, it comes with a significant compliance burden. I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm, I'm going to be loath to go on site and start looking at now. For it doesn't include for the purposes of litigation, but for other purposes, okay. For other purposes, I don't really want to go look at my client's VHI because I don't want to be a BA. I don't want to have to comply. It's an administrative burden for me. Okay, but if part of your business is you're working with docs all the time and you're a CPA and you're showing up at, at, at their site, then you have no choice. Okay, because because what you're doing for them involves, you know, on a regular basis using PHI. Obviously, if you store and maintain like a cloud vendor, etc., uh, storage companies. Companies that destroy PHI, you know, the, the shredding companies, all that, then you know, you're, you 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 have to have definitely have to have a full blown uh, implementation of the security rule, privacy rule, breach notification implemented. So there are some variations, but the variations don't mean that you can just ignore certain requirements. Okay, well, what about this question of international business associates? Because that is a, a widespread practice, right? You have transcriptionists in India, or people reading lab results in China or India, etc. Okay, are they? But what about them? Well, first of all, what you need to understand is those business partners that are not in the U.S. They don't have to comply with U.S. law, right? They're not. The United States has no jurisdiction over those entities, but if you're a U.S. covered entity that are using these international business associates, what would otherwise be a business associate, you better have a business associate contract in place because that's how you make them, and that's how you get them to enforce U.S. law, is you get them to agree that they're going to comply with the business, uh, uh, with the breach notification rule, with the privacy rule, with the security rule in the contract. And that contract is clearly enforceable. So you just can't say, well, you know, we got all our transcriptionists in India. We don't need to, we don't need to mess around with a business associate contract. Not true. In fact, your business associate contract with international business partners should be probably more rigorous because they're not required by law, or they can't, or they're not required because we can't get jurisdiction over them. Okay.
Now, yeah. So what? What is a uh, what is a, a business associate? What do they have to do? You know, and I can tell you, you know, that if you if you all you're doing is these things listed here, then you're likely going to be found in willful neglect as a business associate, and that's where the steepest fines come. This is not the good old days where all all you needed was some you know a three ring binder that you never looked at and had all the HIPAA templates in it. You know you you you, you now have to have um, what we like to say is policies, right? Your, which uh, describe what your organization's intentions are vis-a-vis -vis compliance. You have to have processes that underpin those policies, and you have to be able to track process results. Right. So, if you have policies, you have processes, and you have tracking mechanisms at the granularity level of a requirement, then you have visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. Right. So, just having policies is never going to be enough under the High Tech Act. Uh, you know, you could have you can have these legal documents, but they don't meet the specific requirements. For example, you haven't updated your notice of privacy practices since the Omnibus Rule came out in 2013. You're probably in willful neglect for that because the omnibus rule mandated that you update your notice of privacy practices and include certain things in it. Okay, so yes, heretofore um, HHS has not been aggressive in its audits. In fact, they've been delaying restarting the audits. But there are two ways that you you are two ways that you're going to be more likely to be held to account. One. Is you have a breach. You have a breach. HHS is coming. Okay. Now, two uh, is maybe even more insidious. If you have a patient that complains to HHS, files a complaint on the HHS website, and on the face of that complaint, on the face of that complaint, HHS can determine that that the covered entity or the business associate appears to be in willful neglect, then HHS is mandated to audit, has to audit. What would be an example of that? Well, I can tell you one that Signet got called for $4.3 million probably five years ago was if you refuse, if, if a patient asks for his or her PHI and you refuse to provide it, right? There are special rules in the patient's bill of rights section of the privacy rule. You got 30 days. If you don't do it within 30 days, you got to have a written permission from the a patient to, as an extension. If you get that written extension, you got to tell the patient, "Okay, we're going to do it." You know, 15 days after you give us the extension, whatever, right? You can't just say, "No, you know what? We're not going to give it to you," right? So, if a, a complaint were to show up in HHS office saying so and so covered entity refuses to provide me my PHI, then HHS is going to uh, audit. So uh, those are the two highest probability ways that you're gonna you're gonna have to account for what you uh, for your implementation, right? Because even when the audits start up, the probabilities of any particular business associate or covered entity being audited is going to be really small. Okay, Martin, do, do we have any questions up till now? Not at this time. Okay, so let's talk more about business associate contracts. Okay. A, uh, to start with, right, as a threshold question, they've always been required by the HIPAA Privacy and Security Rule. This is nothing new. This isn't something that the Omnibus Rule introduced. Uh, now, the High Tech Act and the Omnibus Rule did introduce this reciprocal monitoring that we talked about. Okay? And, uh, you know, under the Omnibus Rule, subcontractors, the VAs, now are going to be treated as business associate, right? So, just, you know, lots more, lots more. Um, Cooks in the compliance kitchen. Breach notification and and the breach notification has turned out to be the 800-pound gorilla of the High Tech Act from enforcement. This is the thing that is really provided the teeth, right? Not HH, not HHS audits because they're, you know, because they've been almost non-existent. But there's no escaping from the breach notification rule, okay? And because of that. If you're doing your due diligence with business associates, uh, especially those business associates that store and maintain PHI on your behalf, uh, you may want additional terms and conditions 
in your contract, like we have a right to expect your business associate, your privacy policy, your security policy, and your your uh, the, to you know to make you uh, give us if you're a covered entity to a BA or a BA to a sub uh, examples of how you're training your staff, et cetera, et cetera, because um, because if you don't have those terms and conditions and you don't follow up, you're likely to be sued again under a state negligence theory because you didn't get quote unquote the satisfactory assurances that your business associates were actually complying with the rule, right? So that this is an important point because on the one hand, on the one hand, the rules say, well, you have to, there has to be reciprocal monitoring of the contract, but you don't have to monitor your BAs, um, you know, operations 24/7 because that's in the that's in the that's an impossibility. Okay, but if you just sign the a minimal a minimalist business associate contract just with the bare minimum required terms that the the regs insist that you have and you don't you don't um, cover your butt with some of these other additional terms and conditions and actually act on on those additional terms and conditions like setting up a mechanism for exchanging PHI and other communications in case of a breach happens so a lot of these things we try to put into our model business associate contract is are absolutely necessary to be able to say, uh, to make, make a good faith argument, got the satisfactory assurances that you needed. Now, those satisfactory assurances, that's what the rules say. And, uh, you know, unless you're an attorney, you, you don't really understand that those are weasel words that will be used against you. Uh, because if you didn't do some of these other things, how could you possibly have gotten the satisfactory assurances? I'll give you an example. You're, you You have uh, an EHR vendor that's in the cloud. If you haven't talked about how you know they're implementing the security rule, whether they're encrypting, what their training is, you know, yada yada, and you didn't build some of that into your uh, contract, then how on earth can you make a good faith argument later that you got the satisfactory assurances that you needed? And more than likely, it's going to be uh, a plaintiff's lawyer that's suing you on behalf under a negligence theory, right? So that's the other enforcement that, that can happen, right? A play, plaintiff's lawyer under a negligence theory arguing you were negligent because you didn't get the satisfactory assurances that you should have gotten. Okay, so we're gonna um, switch here to, to a conversation as to why business associates really should lead with compliance because this is not going away and because it's not going away, why not use it as a competitive advantage instead of this dreadful and necessary evil uh, that you have to deal with? But before that, I do that, I'll ask Martin again whether or not we have any questions. Uh, I think you just covered this, but we'll just go over it again. Should or must the BA share details of the BA's risk analysis with a CE, or should this be covered in the BA? Wait, 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 ask me again. I'm not sure that the I got the players quite right here. Okay. Should or must a BA share the details of the BA's risk analysis with a CE, or should this be covered in the BA? Okay, I think I get it. Yes, that I mean, that's a question that speaks to what I was saying, is the additional terms and conditions that you ought to have in the contract is that if I'm in, in our model contract went ahead and put these in if I'm if, if I'm a covered entity I'm going to want to see um, the business associates last risk assessment because that shows that I dug in and did my due diligence and was actually proactive in seeing if you know uh, looking for proof that this business associate is actually complying not just telling me that they're complying in the contract. Anybody can sign their name to the contract saying it's all good, right? So it, 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 the answer is the answer to the must part is no. The answer to the should part is yes. If you want to then later make a good faith argument, you got to do something, right? A, 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 getting a copy of the last risk assessment, that's a great thing, right? Getting a uh, sending out a questionnaire 
with certain questions that you ask all your business associates, that's a good thing, right? A anything along those lines, then you can make a good faith argument that you did your the necessary due diligence to get the satisfactory assurances that you're required to get under the privacy rule and the security rule. So do you absolutely have to under statute? No. Should you? Yes. That's it for the moment. Okay. So why lead with compliance, right? So look, despite the fact that there hasn't been an enhanced inform enforcement, more audits and stuff coming out of HHS other than the 800-pound the gorilla of the breach notification rule, is, this is not going away. Every single day, more and more people are calling for more privacy protections because we have cyber attacks coming out of China, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this the privacy and security are now front and center in this 24-7, 365 online world that we live in. So if that's the reality, why not get in front of it, right? Why not as a business associate, you know, learn, be fully compliant, show your covered entities that you're fully compliant, right, as, as a way of demonstrating your not only your commitment, but as differentiating yourself from your competition. So you should learn to love compliance just like a CPA loves doing taxes, right? And that's the analogy here. Nobody loves compliance. Nobody loves doing their taxes, but the CPA loves doing taxes because that's how they get paid, right? And if you can flip this on its head and use compliance as a marketplace differentiator, not only are you protected, but you may win more business. So how do you go about doing that? So what's the secret sauce? Well, become the subject matter expert, right? Focus on risk management and risk mitigation and be able to, you know, talk to talk and walk to walk when you're out there prospecting for more business. Address the covered entity's pain points. I mean, that's always a great way to sell is, you know, what is the pain that this potential customer is feeling and how do I address it? Well, I, I can assure you that privacy and security today is one of a covered entity's pain points. And harden your compliance touch points. If you're, if you're communicating um, PHI back and forth, then do it using the protocol that uh, the secretary recommended for um, encryption over the wire. So you can take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. Encrypt, you know, encrypt all the PHI that you store and maintain on behalf uh, of a covered entity so that both you and the covered entity can sleep better at night knowing that the PHI is encrypted and if the PHI has been encrypted according to the protocols established by the secretary, then again, you can take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. And of course, you still got to bring the donuts, right? Because that's what you do as a business partner. So how are you going to go about getting the subject matter, subject matter expertise? Well, one thing is you got to implement the security rule and privacy rule um, and breach notification rules, you got to implement them in your organization, right? So you're mandated to do under the statute, right? So get started. You can't have this baby in a month. You want to leave with this? Get started. Get, develop some uh, expertise and then put your own house in order first, right? Show how you're complying with the rules. Show how you're protecting the covered entity or if you're a subcontractor or a VA, how you're protecting the VA by showing them what you do in your own house. Okay. Yes, it's going to require investment of both time and money. However, it's far, it's far more time-centric than money-centric. Okay? There are cost-effective solutions out there that will help you uh, get started and get up to speed fairly quick, given the fact that you're willing to invest the time. Okay? Uh, there are free resources available. Uh, and if you get grounded, if you get take the time to get grounded and, and, and get trained and understand the basics, then when you have to have access to paid resources, you're going to be more informed and make a, a much better decision as to what paid resources uh, you should be acquiring because you're going to be further up the curve. What about risk management and mitigation? Well, the primary reason for becoming a subject matter expert is to show you are better than your competitors at managing and mitigating risk. That's what the covered entities are interested in. At the end of the day, this is a discussion about 
risk management, about risk mitigation, right? You need to learn a new grammar and new lingo for articulating the risk. Remember, this is a greenfield opportunity here. Even five, six years after the High Tech Act, you all, you all, you all participate in the healthcare industry. You understand the health, healthcare industry still remains woefully behind. For example, the financial services industry and privacy and security. Right? It's a little hard to believe, but healthcare is a is a different horse. Right? It's a horse of a different color, and the, the healthcare industry has been laggards in privacy and security. So there's still a greenfield opportunity here uh, to, to differentiate your offerings from your competitors. Okay, so addressing a CE's pain points. So the strategy is premised on a number of difficult to achieve objectives. Right? It's not easy. It's not like, uh, but you know, achieving a competitive advantage is never easy. So get your own house in order, right? Effectively articulate the joint risk of your business relationship. And your your team members that are high tech HIPAA, HIPAA savvy should be the smartest people in the room on this topic. That's how you demonstrate literacy. That's how you demonstrate competency. Is that you're the smartest person in the room on this topic. You can educate your business partners, and you know if if uh, your competitors have that deer in the headlights look when you know when a covered entity says, "Can I see your last risk assessment?" And, you know, and you bring it to the table, you know, in the early calls, you know, the, the covered entity is probably going to stand up and take notice, okay? But you got to be the real deal, otherwise, you know, forget about it. You're going to be found out. So it's not something that you can fake. Uh, so the way you can use this as a differentiator is harden, harden your value proposition. Walk the talk, and the product or service you provide so you must be high-tech HIPAA hardened at all the CE touch points, right? Everywhere there's PHI touch points between the covered entity and you or between you and a sub, uh, that's where you focus, okay? Most of your competitors aren't going to make this kind of an investment. So it's counterintuitive that you could use something that, you know, for all intents and purposes, most people treat. Uh, as a necessary evil, flip it on its head and and try to use it as a competitive advantage. So it's it's a brutally competitive world out there. It's gonna it's becoming more competitive by the day. So you know the Scott Neely uh, expression of eat lunch or be lunch is is really true. Almost no no matter what industry you're you're playing in today, right? You got to be super competitive, you got to have some sort of marketplace differentiator. Bring the donuts. At this point, we're just quickly going to go through our shameless plug. I think most of you know we have um, the HIPAA survival guide out there that has all the high-tech laws and regulation. The HIPAA regulation is full text in the Wikipedia format. We also have products, uh, business associate contracts uh, between a covered entity and a, and a BA, between a BA and a BA. Uh, we have a breach notification framework that walks you through what you should do and the, your analysis of a breach, privacy rule checklist, security rule check, checklist, uh, about 15 or 16 training modules, and essentially our value proposition is this. You can buy the products individually or you can get all of them for a subscription price of $7.95 a year, and in the out years, which are optional, you can uh, it's $4.95 a year to uh, to get any new products or updates to existing products, and I believe Martin, what we we've issued four new products this year. We've issued a audit overview training module. We've issued a uh, security rule audit preparation module, privacy rule audit preparation module, and a breach notification audit preparation module. All based on the um, um, audit protocol that HHS published probably about two years ago now. And so those four new products that we've offered this year were really just free to our subscribers. Okay. Yeah. So they, they didn't have to pay any anything else. But no, yeah, that's that's what I was gonna say. We uh we did a email blast a couple of weeks ago and you know we told everybody that these products were available, how they were separately priced and how they could save money by there you go. Uh buying it as a group 
uh, and then if you had the subscription plan, it was available for immediate download. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that or easier than that. So this slide is a little bit old. Um, yes, we, we, we submitted the audit preparation overview training. We've also submitted the security rule audit preparation training. and But we've also now submitted, as of a few weeks ago, the privacy rule audit preparation and breach notification audit preparation. So a suite of four products. Uh, and if you just buy these products separately, they're like, I, I don't know, they're like six ninety five. So you can buy you could you could buy them separately, but you could buy all the products, uh, our checklists, etc., for seven ninety five. It's part of a subscription. So we like to think that we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients. We provide the step by step how to. We like to think that we provide educational products you can start executing on day one, iteratively. And we also provide a methodology for how to go about launching and maintaining your compliance initiative. So that's it for the webinar, Martin, if we have any other questions. Not at this time. All right, well, very good. This one was a whoop, special whoop, 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 whoop. There, Oh, sorry. This is a, uh, someone was typing. Oh, okay, all right. Is all data stored on behalf of a C considered PHI? How broad is this definition? Would unauthorized access of an address of a patient without any healthcare information access be a HIPAA? Uh, just um, be a, uh, excuse me. HIPAA breach. Can accounting services who has only address information but no healthcare other than billing info have a breach? Well, you know. The answer is no. I mean, unless you can identify the patient, right? Just address information without more um, is not likely to be considered PHI. Of course, now you know, and, and I say not likely. Um, you know, that, that that's something that's going to be uh, increasingly under the microscope because. Now it's becoming easier and easier to identify someone by where they live, right? Just launch Google, launch Google uh, Maps, put in an address, and you, you might be able to triangulate and figure out who it is. So, you know, the broader the broader question is: Let's say it's just accounting information, no address, nothing about the individual, nothing that could possibly identify the individual, just some other data. That you're that is being stored and maintained on behalf of a covered entity. That other data is not going to is not going to be PHI, right? Because it doesn't have any information that would help identify a patient. So when you're talking about protected health information, it's based on individually identifiable health information, um, and so you, there has to be some combination of data that would identify. And it's going to vary on a case by case basis. And that's the rule. That's the general rule. So. You know, like I said, if you could use an address, and it's probably getting easier and easier to do this, to figure out where someone lives, and you know, and then let's say there's only one person in that particular household, and you're uh, the Mayo Clinic or you know some you know some other clinic that specializes in cancer, then you know, uh, an address possibly could be enough. So it, when you're at when you're thinking about these questions, you got to be really thinking about. The definition, the principle that underlies the definition. Can you, could you possibly use this kind of information to identify the individual? Okay. Um, is a CE liable for subcontractors' action or inaction? Well, you know, it's like anything else. I know everyone. Uh, likes yes, clear yes and no, bright line uh, answers and rules, and it's just that the 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 world right turns out to be a lot more messier than that, and so we rarely get these bright line rules. But the the answer is the general answer. The general rule would be no, okay, because the 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 business associate uh, is directly liable for its actions under 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 the high tech act, right? And so there's a direct liability there, right? Now. Now, if the business associate is an agent of the covered entity, 
then just the normal rules of agency will apply. Remember, we talked a little bit about agency being how much control one organization exerts over another. Okay, so like employees are agents, right? And is an employer liable for the acts of its agents within the scope of what they do for that agent? Yes, that's negligence law. That's well established. It's well settled, right? So in the case of agency, the answer is going to be yes. Most of the time, though, most of the time, um, you know, the answer will be no, but who's going to get sued in the case of a breach? Well, you know, it's probably, it's probably going to be the covered entity uh, and, and, you know, the clever lawyers, if you're using a negligence theory, are going to try to, the, well, they'll sue everybody they can sue. They'll sue the covered entity, they'll sue the business associate, and, uh, you know, regardless, it's the cover, regardless of the liability question, right, uh, in, in, in the court, it, it's the covered entity that's going to be on the hook for all the notification costs. Right, and if you listen, if you believe the Panama Institute, two hundred dollars per patient is, is cheap. They say it's almost three hundred dollars per per uh, record. Okay, so a, a breach of five thousand records, right? That's a million dollars, right there. Just a notification cost. We're not even talking about fines. So, you know, would it would a would a CE get fined for the culpability of um, a BA under HIPAA? No. But would they get sued by some plaintiff's lawyer in a negligence action? Probably, because because you know most CEs are not in compliance. They're not treating this with the kind of rigor they should, and so any any um, you know quality lawyer is going to be able to find that probably the CE didn't get the satisfactory assurances that it should have gotten. Therefore, it contributed to the breach. Therefore, it's also liable. Okay, so the question of liability is is much broader than you know. Are you just liable under HIPAA? Because it doesn't do you all that much good to say, well, no, under HIPAA, you're not going to get fined. But you know what? If you get this class action lawsuit, you could be held to account. Okay, well, that goes back to what you were saying before about making sure there are, are protections in your business associate agreement. Uh, going uh, here's another question. Going back to the software, would we consider our IT company a CE? You mean a BA? No, it says a CE. Um, well, no, they're not a CE. Uh, yes, a BA. Sorry, I just got back. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm mean, putting they're not going to be a, a CE because they're not a healthcare provider. But yeah. uh, yes, I mean, well. Not yes. I mean, do they come on site? Are they on a regular basis exposed to PHI? Are they your technical support that's looking at the application databases when there's problems? If they're that kind of IT, are they coming into, you know, do they get access to the IT when you're troubleshooting a network, right? So that's the question is, are they regularly, routinely accessing PHI in order to perform the, the, the function that they're performing? Now, you know, so you just can't make a blanket statement as to is our IT vendor, right? It doesn't work that way. You need to ask a much more granular question is what are they doing? What are they doing? What actions, right? right? When they come on site to help us, what are they doing and are they exposed to PHI? And that, that, that will get you a much better answer than some just categoric abstraction as to whether IT vendors are um, business associates or not. Well, there was a little follow-up after that. Yes, they come once a week and have access to all our computers and software, so I think I, I, they're a BA. <laughs> they're going to be a BA. The HHS made that pretty clear a long time ago. You, you'd be hard-pressed to say that they, they come on once a week, that, that they never come into contact with PHI to do what they do on your behalf. I think that's all we have for today. Well, all right, guys. Thanks for listening. It's, uh, it's been my pleasure being uh, with you today. Thank you.